Okay, we are back. Hello, everybody. To uh, Welcome to our last session of the Juvenile Justice and Alternative Education Strand. This session will be on using data for decision making and monitoring in PBIS, uh, primarily in secure care juvenile justice settings, but a lot of the concepts that our presenters will talk about apply regardless of settings, but especially in those settings where you might have students coming and going and um, uh, turnover in population um, pretty frequently. Our presenters today are Kim Wood, Ashley Greenwald, and Sherry Daisy, and their information is um, really, really good and very, very practical. So, Ashley, I'll turn it over to you, and um, good luck. All right. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I know that this is the last session on the last day, and so we appreciate all of you hanging in there with us. So just uh, very quickly, the guiding questions for today's presentation, what we're really talking about are um, the types of data that are needed for progress monitoring and what are some of the unique considerations when we're talking about using data within a juvenile justice setting. Uh, we also want to think about certain suggestions for making data entry, review, and analysis more user-friendly and manageable. Of course, if we're going to use data, we want to make sure that it is effective and efficient for us. Um, and we want to think about how do we leverage some of the existing data components that we have and how can we uh, solve problems using the data that we're collecting within the facilities. And then we're going to share at the end some sort of real-life examples of these strategies and considerations. The other thing I wanted to share with you quickly before we begin is that um, because there are there has been a lot of interest in using data within uh, juvenile justice and facilities, we have a, a webinar series that's coming up. So if you're interested in participating in the ongoing webinar series, that begins December 3rd and the contact is Brenda Sherman and her email address is listed right here. So go ahead and jot down her email address or take a quick screenshot if you'd like and contact her and she'll get you connected with the information to participate in the upcoming webinars. Okay, so for those of you that are brand new to PBIS implementation within secure facilities, um, I'm going to give a very brief overview, so bear with me. Um, and for those of you that are uh, implementers that have been working in this field for some time, uh, this will be repeat information, but I think it's also always good to kind of reorient ourselves back to the key elements and core components of the work and why we do what we do. So PBIS um, is the practice of building effective environments to teach and encourage appropriate behavior in order to replace any inappropriate behaviors. When we talk about facility-wide PBIS, we're talking about the application of that PBIS technology to the entire facility. And so what we're really looking at is sort of a broad range of systemic and individualized strategies for achieving important learning outcomes from a, a social and emotional and academic perspective while preventing problem behaviors. And this is for all youth. And so um, really this is a, it's a discipline, it's a framework, and it is a model for positive climate change within our facilities. So here are sort of the core elements or the core features of PBIS or an MTSS. And so we'll start with sort of that teaming or, or leadership. Um, all of you who are, have participated in PBIS prior know that it stems from a leadership team and that leadership team is responsible for the shared decision making. The second sort of core feature is that problem solving capacity and the ability to engage in database decision making. And we're gonna spend a lot of our time today talking about the importance of problem solving and database decision making from a, a data collection perspective. Um, systemic implementation and the ability to progress monitor interventions that have been selected. Tiered continuum of supports. This is of course what everyone thinks about when they think about PBIS. This is tiers one, two, and three and having a continuum of support to meet the needs of the individual youth that we're supporting. Regular screening. This is something that I have seen from experience. Um, the facilities do an excellent job of. Um, this is not something we're gonna talk about today but I just wanted to sort of orient you to sort of those core features. Um, implementing evidence-based interventions and making sure that we have systemic and individual improvement, and then providing high quality instruction, both in social and academic domains. And of course, sort of in the, in the middle of this, um, there's a big emphasis on equity and equitable outcomes for all youth. 
So specifically with PBIS, what we're looking at are really four key elements. And so oftentimes when we think about practices or interventions, it's really convenient for us, or in, interventions in general or new initiatives, we often think about practices. And the practices are what support the student behavior. But within PBIS, we have to think about a couple of other areas as well. So we really want to think about also the systems and the systems are in place to support the staff behavior. And then we also need to think about the data collection components and the data collection components allow us to make supported decision making and that's going to be the emphasis of today's presentation. And you'll see sort of that gray circle is all of those three elements are wrapped up in the fourth element, which is the outcomes and we want to make sure that we can monitor those outcomes um, because we want to make sure that the work that we're doing is having the impact that we expect it to have. Okay, so let's kind of talk about um, just PBIS in juvenile justice in general. So I want to share with you, uh, this is not a slide I created. I, I stole this from our national PBIS TA center. So thank you. Um, I believe Jeff Sprague is on here. I think probably this is one of his slides. And so, uh, just so you can sort of orient yourselves to some of the, the best practice recommendations from the US Department of Justice and also the best practice recommendations on behalf of PBIS. And you'll see that there is really significant overlap. Um, it's very complementary. And so you'll see, you know, on the on the left side where we talk about the Department of Justice assessing risk and need, providing targeted interventions, um, providing skills training, increasing positive reinforcement, making sure that we have support in the natural community, um, having appropriate uh, and relevant practices, and then being able to provide measurement and feedback. And on the right, you'll see what PBIS is all about, which is early identification, we've got screening, reinforcement systems, having a continuum of support, making sure that we're teaching. Uh, it's all about a, a climate of prevention, including parent and community engagement as much as possible, database decision making and data sharing. So the, the practice is really um, are very complementary in nature that those practices that are recommended. So very briefly, so here's your continuum of supports, right? This is what uh, we sort of all know when we think about PBIS. And so you'll see here that when we talk about tier one, we're talking about that sort of primary or universal support for all youth. And when I say all youth, I also want to include all staff and across all settings. So especially in facilities, um, it's fairly unique and, or unique from the school systems because there are more areas in which we need to make considerations around what our systems and what our practices look like. Um, we also want to think about as we move up into the higher tiers, I actually heard someone this morning, one of the presenters say that tiers two and three are sort of the carrot for PBIS. And I, I like that. I thought that that was a, a cute sort of um, little analogy, but really we need to, the majority of our emphasis should be at tier one because that's where we're supporting the majority of the youth within our programs. And so if we don't have a really strong foundation, we really can't work effectively and efficiently at those higher tiers of need. The other thing that is important about tier one is that tier one is prevention, right? And so when we talk about prevention, we're talking about prevention from a few different angles. We're talking about prevention of problem behavior and risk behavior, but we're also talking about preventing the need for more intensive individualized interventions. So making sure that we have really good universal supports for all of the youth at our facility. Now, something that is sort of a common misconception, especially when we're talking about implementing PBIS in a juvenile justice facility, a mental health facility, an alternative education environment, a lot of people come to the table and say, well, well all of our youth that we support or all of the students that we support will need tier two and tier three support. And part of that is recognizing what is the population of your particular facility and what does everyone at that facility need? And what everyone at that facility needs becomes tier one practices. And so that's really important that we still build tier one, even when we're talking about a fairly intensive population. Okay, so what I'd like to share with you next is just very quickly, so sort of orienting you to that key element slide, those four diagrams or that Venn diagram looking slide, I wanna share with you across the tiers, what are the, practices and systems that we're talking about that should be in place? And then what are the needs and considerations for the use of data at each tier? 
So um, with regard to tier one, and those of you that are implementing tier one, this is gonna be really familiar to you. The practices and the systems that we're setting up, we're really looking at facility-wide behavioral expectations. So this is where we think about the uh, safe, respectful, responsible kind of um, language that a lot of us create. And of course, it's very contextualized and individualized per facility. Um, and so, you know, some of you may have those exact expectations and some of you may have completely different expectations and that is contextual based on what it is that uh, the, the culture and community of your particular facility feel is most relevant. Behavior lesson plans. These are put in place to make sure that we can teach the youth um, what are the expectations and how to behave and how we as adults expect them to behave. Also how we as leadership expect the adults within our facility to behave. So it kind of goes both ways. So making sure that we have lesson plans in place for teaching. We want to have reinforcement systems and those reinforcement systems acknowledge appropriate behavior and make it more likely that we'll see those appropriate behaviors happening within the future. Of course, we also include discipline systems. So another common misconception about PBIS is that PBIS is all sunshine and rainbows and we do no discipline. And that is absolutely incorrect. And especially when we're talking about um, you know, the, the populations that you all are supporting, we have to have really good discipline systems in place, but they need to be consistent and they need to be um, equitable. And so that's one of the things that we spend a lot of time on in tier one is making sure that we've got good discipline systems in place as well as good reinforcement systems so that we are encouraging appropriate behavior and we're discouraging appropriate behavior consistently at the same time. And then of course we have our data collection system. So tier one is where you really spend a lot of time building your data collection systems and, and you have considerations on how to use data within your facility. Now let's flip over to the data side on the right. Um, the, the purpose for data collection at tier one is so that we can make universal or facility wide data decisions. And what I mean by that is we want to get a pulse on how the facility is doing at any one given time. How are we doing in the recreation rooms? How are we doing outside, um, you know, on the community in the community areas? How are we doing on the transportation vehicles? How are we doing in the classrooms? How's it going in, in some of the different um, living facilities? And so those are some of the things that we wanna think about when we're talking about data at tier one. It kind of gives us a good universal pulse of how the system is functioning as a whole and how the facility is doing. We want to be able to disaggregate data by location, by time, by staff member, and by perceived motivation. And the reason that we, we talk about disaggregating data, and when I say disaggregating, I mean, um, we want to be able to take a look at data by sort of some of these individual questions. So for example, the question may be, where are we having the most referrals? With, in the presence of which staff members are we having the most discipline referrals? Um, those are some of the questions that we want to ask because those are questions that will help us improve our systems and practices at tier one. So we have to leverage those data in order to have the most effective systems and practices. At tier two, uh, this is where we start to get into some of the more targeted interventions. And when I say targeted interventions, I mean we're starting to match interventions specific to youth need. And so now we're talking about some of the youth that we're supporting. So the practices and systems that are pretty common across tier two, this is where we usually start to implement universal screeners. Um, we talk about individualized self-monitoring programs. We have targeted group interventions often hosted by uh, mental health professionals. And then of course we have our tier two team. So we want to make sure that we've got all of these sort of systems in place and that will set us up for both the effective practices but also so that we can identify the youth that need additional supports and how those youth are doing when they're accessing those additional supports. So let's bump to the data side on the right. At tier two, we need to start looking at triangulation of data. And when I say triangulation, I mean multiple sources of data are used in a decision to identify, like I was just explaining, who needs to access tier two. So how do we know which youth in our facility need more support? we need to triangulate the data. Oftentimes, we're looking at, at some form of academic data, perhaps some kind of attendance 
our participation data. We're going to definitely want to leverage our discipline data. We'll likely want to leverage some of those universal screeners and assessment data to identify uh, mental health concerns and needs. So those are the sources of data that we're going to be pulling from. And some of you may have additional sources of data. But at minimum, we want to make sure that we've got multiple sources of data to suggest that a youth needs advanced supports. Part of that is that we want to make sure that our tier one is really effective. So if we don't have those good data decision rules in place, we cannot decide effectively who needs access to more supports. We, we risk missing youth that need more supports. We also risk putting youth into supports that are not needed or perhaps need to be implemented at tier one because we have so many youth that need that same level of support. So when I say data decision rules, that's really what I'm referring to is how do we get how does someone get selected for tier one or for tier two supports? And how does someone get out of tier two supports? So we don't want to provide tier two support forever. Um, some youth may need these supports for a long period of time. And I'm not suggesting there's any specific finite timeline on tier two, but we do want to have some kind of data decision rule in place of how does someone get in and how does someone get out? Um, we also want to make sure that we can engage in effective progress monitoring at tier two. So when I say progress monitoring, now I'm talking about when we put individualized interventions in place, how do we know if they're effective? And then this is where we also start to look at disproportionality. So do we have uh, referrals that are higher uh, for certain socioeconomic groups, for certain groups of, of color, for certain disability statuses. And so we're gonna to start to look at the disproportionality data at tier two as well. Now at tier three, this is where we're talking about um, the individualized interventions. And so here's where we're starting to identify very high risk youth. We're gonna start implementing functional behavior assessments, individualized support plans. We're gonna have tier three teams to look at these data, to review these data ongoing. And on the right side, you'll see again, very similar to tier two that we've got individual behavior progress monitoring set up. We have our data decision rules for how does someone access support at tier three? How do we know when they no longer need supports at tier three? And then what are those progress monitoring? Um, components look like. So those are all of the considerations that we're looking at. Now, additional considerations. So these considerations actually come from experience with implementation. And so these are some of the things that we have seen um, across different facilities, across different states. We're here kind of sharing some information and learning from, from different perspectives. And so one of the, the first perspectives uh, are considerations for data collection is funding. Um, and so, you know, this comes along with the territory of implementing PBIS in general, but we want to think about, okay, if we're thinking about adopting a new data collection system, what is the system? That's the first question that we want to use. And the nice thing is Sherry and Kim are going to share a whole lot of, about that with you in a moment. Um, but it might, might take an initial investment. And the systems that we're talking about, the data systems that we're talking about today are actually very low cost, um, but they do require an investment and some commitment. Um, the other thing we want to think about is sustainability of those systems. So is this a good choice for us ongoing? Will we have people that can enter those data that can pull those reports? Well, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. The second main consideration is gaining support. And so when I talk about gaining support, um, the support needs to come primarily from the leadership team and the administration first. So of course the leadership team and administration at the facility has to commit to a new data collection system and also to the understanding that the data collection system will be useful for them and that it will be ongoingly sustainable for them. Um, the second component to that is the staff buy-in. So we also need to make sure that the staff are willing to participate in a new data collection system. So just like we heard actually in the past two presentations, uh, buy-in is really important, right? So we have to make sure that the staff are willing to participate in the work that we're requesting. Otherwise, the system will fall apart. And so some of the considerations for staff buy-in and data collection is that it may be a little bit of learning on their part. They may be required to collect a little bit different type of data than they're used to collecting. And so that's some of the considerations as well. We also need to make sure that we have the youth commitment and that the youth know how to access their data, interpret their data, and that they're also committed to using the data. Now, a DBDM stands for data-based decision-making. Um, 
one of the considerations around database decision making is that this can really help us identify if we're reaching fidelity. And so most of you are probably using a tool already called the tiered fidelity inventory. If you're not, it's available free online on pbis.org and it's an excellent tool for assessing where we're at with regard to fidelity. And like we've discussed and in previous presentations, you have to have a really good foundation at tier one before you move into the higher tiers. And that's how you know as a facility that you're ready to move on. Uh, we also want to be able to make database decisions regarding tier two and tier three progress monitoring. So we talked a little bit about that in the previous slides, but making sure that we have a good way to understand if we're being effective um, in the work that we're doing, and especially when we're putting in more individualized interventions. One of the considerations, um, especially when we're talking about implementation in facilities is that oftentimes I hear, well, the professionals are fidelity or professionals as fidelity. And so, um, you know, myself, I'm a licensed clinician, I'm a, I'm a licensed behavior analyst, but just because I'm a licensed behavior analyst doesn't mean that I am fidelity in, or, or the fidelity of the implementation or the intervention. We still have to have a way to monitor the effectiveness for the youth that we're implementing those interventions for. So how do we know if the, if the youth is making enough progress in a certain intervention? And so what I like to say here is access is not enough, right? So just access to a certain service or intervention is not enough. We also have to monitor the effectiveness. A fourth consideration is why more data? So why would we want to collect more data? Uh, facilities collect tons of data, right? Um, but oftentimes data are collected for reporting for mandates. And usually those data are um, something that are reported on maybe twice a year, once a year. Um, when we're talking about PBIS data, we're talking about really being able to use our data to drill down to identify certain areas of need, areas for change, and how to improve our systems. And so um, when we talk about the difference between sort of like punitive and preventative data collection, punitive data collection is discipline tracking. All of the facilities do this in some form or another, right? We track incidents. And of course, in PBIS, we want to do that too, but from a preventative perspective, we want to track incidents by location, by staff, by time of day, by points and progress that the youth are making, and all of those things help us be a little bit more cohesive in our systems. The fifth consideration is staff turnover. So uh, we do have high rates of staff turnover within the facilities. Um, of course, we, you know, part of that is that we have to consider the leadership team in the staff turnover. And if one of our main admins turns over, sometimes systems fall apart. Um, but but uh, data collection and data collection at capacity is something that can really help maintain a system even in the face of staff turnover. Uh, data collection can also help with new hires because when we collect data on who's been trained, um, we can sort of start to leverage some of those data or we can, we can make sure that we know who's been trained, but we can also leverage existing data to to foster some of the buy-in, especially when we have a new staff who's maybe new to the system. So they can see sort of from where we've been to where we are now and why the systems are so important that we have in place and why we're asking them to behave perhaps in a different way than they've ever behaved before. The sixth consideration is data entry. So when we're thinking about new data collection systems, we do have to think about um, who is going to enter the data and what platforms are needed. So of course, those are just some general considerations and very much a team decision. That's not something that any of us can tell you. You all have to decide for yourself if that's something that is going to be effective for you. Um, sharing data, we, we wanna think about who do we wanna share the data with and on what frequency. We probably want to think about sharing data with staff, sharing data with youth, sharing data with families, sharing data with community members, sharing data with funders, et cetera. There's all kinds of ways that we can leverage the data that we collect internally to help sort of move our work forward. And then of course, we also wanna think about how can we leverage some of these data for other initiatives? So we wanna think about, you know, we do have mandated reporting. We also want to think about um, perhaps using some of the data for, for release conditions, for, for um, parole. So all of these things are things that we should be thinking about when we are shifting our data collection priorities and really aligning them with PBIS systems. And I'll turn it over to Kim now. Okay, I'm gonna request control of your screen here. All right, awesome. 
Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, that lays such an excellent foundation. And I'm going to drill down a little bit more. I'm just going to um, kind of lay the, the, the conceptual framework for then the case study that Sherry's going to be sharing us with us later. My name is Kim Wood. I'm a behavior analyst and PBIS coach in Northern California. Um, and I also, I've trained community schools and um, juvenile halls in scaling up PBIS. And then I'm also the behavior analyst and PBIS coach for our local facility. So uh, really, first of all, I just want to say, as we heard in some of our other sessions today, and as Ashley was talking about, in especially in juvenile justice facilities, there's there are so many different kind of issues that come up that we need to have some creative problem solving, solving around. So huge props to everybody who's doing this work. We all know that it's there's all sorts of different things that come up. Um, in talking to different um, facility teams over the years, I've heard a lot of different common themes about um, issues that come up, whether it's staff turn issues and staff turnover or revolving door of students um, or revolving door of staff or um, staff schedules or selecting incentives. Um, but what's interesting is that what doesn't come up a lot is, is how um, is trying to troubleshoot how to use data in the in the um, systems. So that's really what we want to talk about today is focusing on how can we really leverage the data like Ashley was saying to make sure that it's working for you guys. Um, what we've really seen is that um, once teams build the, the kind of data analysis portion into their um, into their processes and systems, that's kind of what makes their PBIS program come alive. You know, it shifts it from, um, from maybe just having, you know, posters on the walls and teaching lessons and a reward, you know, reward system to all those kind of aha moments of like, okay, this is how we can actually shift to the positive social change that we're, we're trying, to, um, trying to achieve. So for those of you who, who have worked either with, um, with juvenile justice settings or in juvenile justice settings, as Ashley and some of the other presenters had mentioned, there's already so much data collected for a variety of different reasons, 24 seven, hourly sometimes. Um, and it's for different reasons. A lot of the times it might be for annual progress monitoring or goal setting, um, but um, a, a great deal of the time staff aren't necessarily aware of how that data is being used um, or and really they just know more like, well, this is just something that I need to do. Um, so that real importance of, of building this in and making sure that everyone is aware that this data can be used to make effective and immediate change with the youth that you're serving. Um, and so today, really what we're going to be talking about is some general concepts around how to leverage that data, whether you already have a data system set up and you're looking to kind of you know, put some icing on the cake um, on that, or if you're looking at selecting a new system or modifying your system, we're really hoping that um, some of the things that we, we touch on today will um, will address some of those. So, whoops, I gotta, whoops, you know what? Ashley, I might need. I think you just need to use the arrow key on your keyboard, Kim. It is not working. Can I have you advance? Oh, oh, there we go. Okay, got it. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry, tech issues. Um, so again, when we're talking about some of these concepts, the two real underlying questions for you to think about with your teams, first of all, the kind of thinking about what's your PBIS vision board. So what is it, as we've heard in some of the other sessions, what does PBIS look like, feel like, sound like within, um, within your program? Um, what real positive social outcomes are you looking for for, for your, the youth that you serve? And then the partner question to that is how do you know when you're getting those results? Um, are, and actually, are, are you measuring that? So in the course of all of the, you know, the, of everything that we're going to share today, kind of keep those questions in the back of your mind as well. Okay, so real kind of big picture here is beginning with the end in mind. This is, the, is really kind of boiling down the whole data-based decision-making process that Sherry's going to get into talking to you about, but it's going through this here's what, so what, you know, now what cycle. Um, and I, we can't stress enough that this cycle needs to be embedded within every single PBIS discussion, within every single PBIS team meeting. Um, this is, as I said before, this is what when people really grasp onto this process, this is what makes PBIS come alive um, and, and allows us to make 
immediate and ongoing um, changes. Um, the, so in a nutshell, really, uh, here's what is, this is the data that we're looking at, you know. Um, so what is taking a look at that data and asking, is it a problem? Do we have something here that we need to solve? Um, and now what is, what are we going to do about that? Um, and this whole database decision-making process really does need training and coaching um, because it's not, a, it's not a natural process per se for um, schools or for you know, juvenile justice facilities. It, it takes a lot of coaching to know how to look at, it, look at the data carefully um, and select one issue and connect it to some evidence-based practices. Um, so if we don't have that training and coaching, some of the time what can happen um, is we get stuck just at that here's what phase. We have all this data and we can describe a lot of, a, a lot of issues that are going on, but we don't necessarily have the skills to be able to, or, or we don't have a structure um, of, of looking at it every single month. Okay, is this a problem? You know, what are we going to do now? And then that process repeats itself over and over and over again. We go from um, you know, we, we tried some solutions. Now we go back to the, here's what, and look at the data and see if we were able to um, make some of that, that positive change that we were looking for. Um, so we really need to have these conversations with our PBIS teams and facilities as well. Do we have the data that we need to have in place? Do we have the systems that we need to have in place so that we can truly engage in this process um, and take our, and really, really strengthen that last foundational piece of our tier one systems? Okay, whoops, I went a little too far here, sorry. I'm having some tech problems. Ah, okay, I'm gonna, as I'm gonna still try to click on this a little bit, actually, uh, I can't, sorry about that. Um, I'm actually going to give up control to Ashley because I'm having some issues here, sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. You could take me back one slide and then I only have two left. Um, so one kind of disclaimer that we wanted to talk about today, um, facilities have choices of all of a variety of different data systems that they can use. There's already a lot of different data that's being collected in facilities. Um, what we're talking, what we're really focusing on a lot today is um, about behavior referral data. And so we're going to be highlighting, Sherry's gonna be highlighting one specific data system called SWIS. Some of you may already be familiar with it, but I wanted to just describe some of the key elements of, of SWIS um, so that you know that that's, um, it, it is an option for juvenile justice facilities. It's an online data system. It focuses on collecting major and minor behavior referrals. Um, it focuses on um, making sure that we have all of those elements Ashley was referring to the, you know, all the WH questions and, you know, what's happening, where, where is it happening, so on and so forth. It's confidential, secure, all of that. Um, I think that there's been um, kind of a thought that juvenile justice facilities couldn't necessarily use Swiss because it has more historically been used in K-12 campuses um, versus alternative programs. But it really can be customized and adapted. Sherry's gonna show you some really good examples of that to be able to be utilized in juvenile justice facilities. Um, there are some fixed fields in it, if you will. So there's categories that you can um, select, such as locations um, that may look like they're more, more set up for a traditional campus, um, like gym or library or bus stop or something like that. Um, but there are options for customization and you don't have to use some of those fields. So it's really not an issue. It can be configured also to go 24 seven, you know, so it's not just during regular school days. It's not just Monday through Friday. Um, so again, in, in my work and working with several different juvenile justice facilities, um, we have been able to customize it and set it up so that it works very effective, effectively. And it solves all, it, you know, bridges the gap for a lot of data issues that a lot of facilities um, often experience. It is $350 a year. That is at cost to University of Oregon. Um, and and the, every time um, a facility has an account, there's a Swiss facilitator set up. So for example, I might be a Swiss facilitator for our local, local you know, juvenile hall, um, and the Swiss facilitator can help with customization and adding users and technical support um, and, and all of that. So again, the, what we're talking about today really can, all of these are um, elements that can apply to any data system. We're gonna be highlighting Swiss just so that you can see how that works. Um, but think as we talk about those, if you have a different data system 
think about the elements that we're talking about, how they could also apply to, to your data system. Ashley? Okay, so we thought that it would be helpful to sort of summarize into some main categories what, the, uh, what some really important considerations are for effective data systems um, in juvenile justice facilities based off of our experience and sometimes learning a little bit, a little bit the hard way. Um, so those are broken into data system design, the logistics of, of data collection and entry, and then the um, database decision-making decision process. You can see on the left-hand side of this slide um, that training and coaching really does need to span all of these things. Um, again, our teams are not often and not always used to um, these kind of processes or, or knowing to kind of think about some of these things in the big picture ahead of time. So training and coaching really should be woven either in the internal level with an internal coach or trainer or external um, level uh, until there is, you know, really uh, until there are strong systems and practices and until there's fluency um, with these areas. So I'm going to highlight a couple of these, um, a couple specifics in each of these categories and I'll be passing it off to Sherry and she can talk about her program where they and, and how they actually roll this out of their program. Um, so first point about data system design is teams need to really carefully consider what they need to be tracking for their specific facility. Um, you know, PBIS in juvenile facilities or alternative programs is, are kind of like snowflakes. Everyone's different, you know, with respect to their values and, and what they think that they need to um, track. And so it's looking at what is going to be socially important in our context what do we need to know about to know if there's going to be a problem with behavior referrals? So, um, you know, what are specific things that might be precursors to bigger safety and security issues, so on and so forth. So there's, it really does take time to identify what types of um, behaviors we wanna track and then actually going and um, really digging into um, very specific definitions of, of all of those as well. If you attended some of the presentations on equity the other day, a theme that you probably heard is um, the more specific the definition is of your behavior, the less likely you are to have disproportionate outcomes. And so that really comes into play here too, is making sure that everything is just very, very um, specifically defined. Um, your data should be able to answer all of your WH questions. So again, we talked about that, who, what, where, you know, um, why even was the behavior occurring? And then what happened afterward? Tracking what was the response actually to the, to the behavioral issue. Um, you should, your data should allow you to create a sentence, um, basically something along the lines of, there's a group of students engaging in X behavior in this location at this time, you know, for, um, at, for this purpose, generally speaking. Um, that, that when, if you can pull the, a sentence like that out of your data, then it really does allow you more to um, be able to do some effective troubleshooting uh, about that. Um, Ashley mentioned this too. It's not we're not just talking about behavior data here, although the there's a big focus on behavior referral data to kind of take the temperature of what's going on in the facility. But it's also critical at tier one to also include survey data of students and staff, whether that's you know school climate survey or safety surveys, so on and so forth. Um, reinforcement data. It's an excellent. I rely on reinforcement data at my sites to know you know, what are we acknowledging in our students? Who's getting acknowledged? That's a really helpful way to be able to, um, to make decisions and, and troubleshoot if, we, if we've got a, an, an issue happening. And then also fidelity data, um, whether that's the TFI or taking fidelity on new practices, so on and so forth. So the, that first category of data system design really is about thinking very carefully, what's important to us, what do we need to know, um, and how are we going to define and plan for that for our context? Um, the second one, real important for juvenile justice settings, uh, the logistics of data collection and entry. I mean, safety and security and supervision are key, key um, issues in juvenile justice facilities. And so that we have to take that into consideration when it comes to data input. A lot of the time staff can't be freed up in the middle of the day when they're having to do active supervision in order to enter data. Um, that also being said, the um, we have to remove any obstacle that we can to make sure that people are recording data um, and collecting data as they need 
to. So looking at things like having really carefully designed forms that are easy to use, have your definitions right there so that the staff can refer to them, you know, or have it posted. Um, you know, as far as data entry, you might have to think outside of the box. Maybe it's coordinating with a paraprofessional in the school program who can do the data entry, or um, it's in some of our programs, we have our graveyard shift at the facility do the data entry because um, they, you know, they have a little bit more flexibility with students with youth supervision um, over graveyard. So thinking about how are we going to remove as many obstacles as we can so that the data collection and entry isn't an issue. Um, and then also considering when it's a, if it's new, if you're starting a new behavior referral form, for example, or um, you know, using a new data system like Swiss or something like that, um, you may want to consider doing some fidelity checks uh, ahead of time when you first start. Um, so, for example, one of our sites, um, they were already always recording when there was a level drop for a student. And so when they started um, collecting behavioral referral data for the Swiss data system, the graveyard shift would take a look at the um, level drop documentation and they would double check and make sure that there was actually a behavior documentation form also for that. Because if there was a level drop, it should be, you know, it should be recorded. Um, so, and then if, if there wasn't also a, a behavior documentation form for that, then there was feedback and coaching around, okay, we need to go, go back and, and fill this out. So um, thinking again, big picture here is how do we remove obstacles, whether it's with training new systems or, you know, making it easy to, to enter, um, to, to record and enter data. Um, the last main category here, database decision-making processes. Um, can't stress this enough, having user-friendly data summaries or graphs. Swiss provides that, a lot of other programs do as well, or you know, sometimes I get in and I just create my own graphs um, just so that it really is easy, it's user-friendly. Um, you know, whether it's in a facility or school, a lot of our team members don't have a lot of experience or fluency with um, analyzing data and we don't want to scare people off. You know, they're not all nerdy behavior analysts like we are. So really making it as, as um, approachable, making your data summaries as approachable as possible and continuing to just expose staff to data is, is really, really helpful. Um, one huge thing that's talked about in juvenile justice facilities is staff buy-in. And I've found that um, really looking at exposing them to data that's user-friendly does can really help tip the scales with staff buy-in. So for example, you show them baseline data at a PBIS meeting on something, you make one small action plan around what you're gonna do about it. You come back and show them the data the next month, like, wow, oh my gosh, look at this, this works, look at this improvement. Um, just something as, as little as that can really help with buy-in as well. So um, being able to really drill down the data and find out, you know, answer those questions of, okay, where is this problem behavior happening or when is it happening? I'm sure he's gonna give us some examples about that, but that's another real key feature. Um, if you can't drill down your data, you might have some misleading data. Uh, so, you know, for example, if you have a site saying, all right, we have 20 referrals for um, inappropriate live line movement or issues with transitions or whatever, 20 referrals. Well, it's one thing if you say, well, that was across 20 different youth versus, well, that was three different youth and one of them, one of, 18 of the referrals were for one student. You know, those two different, if you can't drill that down and find that out, it's, they're two completely different conversations. So really being able to have that um, capability is important. I mentioned the training and coaching for the database decision-making process. You know, uh, it's more typical human nature for teams to sit around and, you know, when they first start this process to sit and talk about what's going wrong. You know, that's just human nature um, and, you know, get stuck, getting stuck kind of at the here's what phase. Um, and so um, we need to have coaching and training and even some prompts and um, cheat sheets about how do you go through that thought process of database decision making um, until it becomes something that the team has fluency with and until it's part of the part of the ongoing process. Um, and the last piece before I hand it over to Sherry is uh, specific to juvenile justice facilities and other alternative settings too, is that the data analysis has to account for high student turnover. So what I've found is that um, this often requires addition, some additional calculations. So for example, we can't just take the, the raw data on something and compare it from one month to the next. 
um, we have to account for the fact that we've got this revolving door. In some months we have more students, some months we have fewer students, sometimes the length of stay is longer, sometimes it's long, it, you know, it's shorter. Um, I, one, of, one of the programs that I worked with was showing graphs from year to year of decreasing referrals every year. Look, it's decreasing, it's decreasing. Well, at the same time, their um, student enrollment was decreasing. So does that actually mean that progress was being made or does it just mean that they had fewer students and fewer opportunities? So you have to make sure that you're looking at your data carefully so that you're comparing apples to apples. And that might be taking your um, raw numbers and dividing them um, for a short period of time by the number of students served during that time or um, the number of nights that you had heads in beds or whatever it might be, um, really leveling that playing field so that you're, you're comparing the data um, equally from one, one time period to the, to the next. Um, and the other part of that data analysis is that you might need to chunk your data comparisons into smaller time frames because you do have changes in culture and shift and everything. You might want to just compare one month to the next month, you know, rather than one semester to the next semester or some schools just compare one year to the next year. So thinking about what's really going to help you put your finger on the pulse of what's truly happening so that you can have the information that you need to um, make decisions as a team. Um, so that being said, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on over to Sherry and she's going to elaborate with her, um, her, her example of how she leveraged all these things in her program. Thank you so much, Kim. Let me make sure I requested, ah, there we go. Okay, uh, so my name is Sherry Daisy. I have the pleasure of working with um, Ashley at the University of Nevada, Reno. And lucky for me, I met Kim uh, at last year's forum in Chicago. And I knew I was most likely going to be working with uh, some facilities here in the state of Nevada. So that's why I had gone to Kim's talk. And she talked about adapting Swiss as a data collection system. Um, so I just want to thank Kim for her mentoring through this process because none of what I'm about to present would have happened without her. Um, and it's really, um, we just are so excited to keep passing on this knowledge and the skills uh, that we have learned in terms of using data to improve our practices and support the youth uh, that we work with. So I get the fun uh, job of sharing with you a case example of a facility that I support here and um, their kind of evolution, change, modification of their data systems and practices. Um, and it is a long-term youth correctional center. Uh, the average youth spends about seven months at this facility. And uh, we just started this work in February of 2020. So um, I'm sure, uh, well, I am at least impressed with how much progress we've made in such a short period of time, especially given the fact that beginning in March uh, with the onset of COVID, all of the coaching and technical assistance that has been provided to this facility has happened in a virtual format. Um, speaking of the coaching and technical assistance, uh, I do also want to thank uh, Jessica Adge, who has worked closely with me in supporting this facility um, in uh, their practices. And I know she's joining us today. So Jessica, thank you for your work and uh, what we're going to present today. Um, so it's important to note here that this staff at this facility is exceptional when it comes to their motivation and their dedication. I didn't have to work on buy-in, they just immediately bought in. Uh, once I shared with them uh, what we would be able to do with Swiss, they were like, yes, let's go for it, we're in. So that's not always the case. Um, so I'm sure that has affected how quickly we've adapted their systems and uh, the progress that we've made uh, because they are very easy to work with and uh, really dedicated. In fact, because of that, we meet uh, every two to three weeks instead of the typical kind of monthly schedule because they want to get stuff done and uh, meetings help motivate that. So we meet uh, more frequently than typical and the staff is very motivated. In terms of training, uh, Jessica and myself, uh, as the external coaches, train the PBIS team, and then the team trains the staff. So all of the uh, examples that I'm going to share with you, that's kind of the process that we've gone through. Okay. Um, so hopefully there's not too much on this slide, but I felt like it was important to give you some visuals of the process we went through and the change in forms. 
So Kim talked about the first thing you want to do is look at your data system design. And so uh, what we needed to do as our first step of revising their system was to update their behavior tracking form to include the specific Swiss problem behavior definitions that are built in and are kind of fixed fields uh, within this online platform. So on the left there, you can see that we had a multitude of behaviors that were that they were tracking on their uh, tracking form prior to moving to Swiss. And we needed to fit those behaviors into the problem behavior definitions or categories that are built into Swiss. So for example, minor problem behaviors include defiance and disruption and minor physical contact. Those are all built into Swiss as options. And their major problem behavior categories include everything from fighting to gang affiliation to display to physical aggression to theft. What's highlighted in those two little blue boxes are the only two custom fields that we had to add to account um, for the problem behaviors that they wanted to track at the facility. So Swiss doesn't have a category for sexually related offenses or the use or possession of contraband. Uh, because, and so those are the only two unique fields that we had to add because everything else uh, we were able to include in a sample definition. So this is just, this is on the back side of their behavior tracking form. It includes on the left, all of the minor and major problem behaviors that are the uh, pull down kind of uh, drop down categories in Swiss. And on the right are the sample definitions. So what we did as a first step, I'm gonna go back to this slide, is we looked at like all those main minor problem behaviors that were listed there and all those major ones and all those critical ones. And we just made sure that they were reflected in the sample definitions. Um, it took us a meeting or two to do this. Uh, first, we had to have quite a bit of discussion about it, but once we got all, all on the same page, it was a fairly simple process. We have to go back to this every so often because we'll realize that we have uh, behaviors that were not included or uh, behaviors that were overlapping and it was confusing. Um, so this is kind of an ongoing thing. I'm, I'm not sure what version we're on of our tracking form, but it's probably like four or five, uh, but every time it gets a little better. So that was the first step. Step two, when we looked at our data system design, was to update the actions taken or the consequences to include additional teaching opportunities. And as you know, after attending these talks for three days, uh, this is about teaching, right? We need to teach the behaviors, the alternate behaviors, the replacement behaviors. And so what I was really excited about, and this was um, driven by the team, on the right there, you can see those are their previous consequences or action taken, and the majority of them are, are punitive, you know, loss of privilege, work de detail, those types of things. Um, we didn't get away, get away from all of those, but we added in, in that blue box, three teaching consequences. So having a mental health session, having a group mentor session, having another type of group session. So that was the second piece that was uh, pretty significant in this revision of, of their um, data system practices. Now this is, hopefully I'm gonna be able to explain this to you without confusing you too much. This was the third step. And this is an area in Swiss that is probably the most challenging when it comes to adapting it to a juvenile justice setting or an alternative program that's a 24 hour setting. Because as Kim mentioned, the locations in Swiss are for a classroom or for a school, a school setting. And uh, we have many other locations within uh, our facility that are not applicable for, for a school. So for example, if you look there on the left, um, medical, uh, visiting, uh, their, their residential halls, intake, offsite transport are all common settings in correctional facilities for youth. So what we did was instead of creating a ton of custom fields, which would make our data analysis more complicated, and this idea actually came from one of the team members, um, so I can't take credit for it, um, but we created a key. So when the staff who are observing the problem behavior and are documenting the problem behavior, they have the information on the left and they circle the real location within the facility that the problem behavior occurred. The graveyard staff who are entering those paper referrals into the Swiss uh, online platform, they use this key so that they can then enter them based on the fields that are available in Swiss. 
So for example, if, it, if there was a problem behavior that occurred in Everest 2, which is one of the units, you could look on the right there if you're entering the data and you would say, oh, Everest 2 is the office. So they enter it as the office. And then when we generate the reports, which you'll see later, all we have to do is put a little text box over office that says Everest 2. And then we're able to interpret that data very easily. So this was probably the most, the biggest modification that we had to make uh, when it came to using Swiss for our setting. Um, so that's kind of like how we designed uh, our data system, a brief overview. There's lots of other pieces, but we obviously don't have all the time to get into everything. So now I want to move into the logistics of the data collection entry, which is that step two for an effective data system. As I mentioned, uh, we use the paper behavior tracking form that the staff uh, complete. And then we have very explicit data entry instruction sheets uh, for the graveyard staff to be able to enter that information into Swiss. It includes things like the key that I just mentioned, lots of screenshots, um, and the facility staff help to develop uh, this form as well. So we have a very collaborative working uh, relationship, which is great. One of the things we quickly realized was that because it is a 24 hour uh, facility and it's a 24 hour time frame, we would frequently have errors like um, at 12 a.m. there was a, a problem in the dining hall. Well, we know that at 12 a.m. the youth are in their beds, <laughs> so hopefully, right? Um, so we have our administrative staff conducting those types of fidelity checks. If there are er general errors in uh, data entry, they go in and they check that out and correct that. That's something that we've had to work towards because at the beginning we would sit down at our PBS uh, team meeting and then we would spend all this time making the corrections. So we've uh, have some uh, systems in place to correct for that now. The other thing that we do is uh, someone at the facility um, every month uh, updates the enrollment and ethnicity data so that we're operating from that, uh, from the most current information because youth do join and leave the facility uh, throughout the month. So every month that is updated to account for uh, that type of data. Now we get to the fun part. This is my most favorite, favorite thing about what Swiss has allowed us to do is really focus on database decision making. And uh, we review our data reports at every team meeting. Um, and like I said, those are held two to three weeks, every two to three weeks. There's probably a couple that we've missed doing reports, but for the most part, it's a very regular, regular routine. And we have identified a data analyst team that prepares those data reports and conducts the drill downs and develops like those precise problem statements like Kim talked about, about the who doing what, where and when and why, um, prior to the team meetings to make our team meetings more efficient. Um, in school settings, uh, typically there'll be one data analyst on the team, just one, but we really have this team of people because everybody has a different perspective and knowledge and it would be inappropriate to just have like one person trying to figure it all out. Um, so those meetings last about 30 to 45 minutes and um, and it's it's it, it facilitates the database decision making that can occur in the team meetings. As Ashley mentioned when she was talking, another benefit of this is that it's very easily easy for the staff to create individual youth data reports that can be used for like parole meetings and things like that. Um, the, the best thing in my perspective from Swiss is that these things can happen literally with a couple clicks of a button. So that's what really makes it a useful process. So those are some of the things of that. So on this slide, I have some examples of the common data reports that we will be looking at every month when we meet as a team. And as uh, Kim mentioned, they're very user friendly. Um, they're simple, they're easy to interpret. Uh, the one on the top left there, that um, answers the question of when, right? So we can look and see that in the month of August, there were significantly higher referrals on Monday and Tuesday. So we can be like, hmm, why would that be, right? And then that allows us to drill down into the data and think about what is happening on those days and why are they so different from the other days. The graph on the top right is also answers the question of when, and that's referrals by time. This was also the month of August. Um, I want to focus your attention there to the peak in time at six o'clock. That's dinner time. Um, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. 
Uh, what's interesting is we put this PowerPoint together quite a, quite a while ago, over a month ago, but our recent data for September, because school has now started, is that we see very significant peaks at exactly 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. and 1 p.m. And uh, I recently met with the education staff at the facility and they were like, that's every transition that we have. So simply by looking at that graph, the education staff are now going to tighten up and structure their transitions because they're realizing we see these huge peaks in problem behavior at those exact times. In the middle there, that represents referrals by problem behavior. I'm gonna talk about this one a little bit later too, but that M defiance on the far right, that stands for minor defiance. And you can see that's the majority of referrals that are be being entered fall into this category. We have done some problem solving around that as well. On the bottom left, that answers the where question. And you can see there where we put in those text boxes to represent the locations that are specific to this facility. Um, we see an increase in one of the units, Sierra One, and followed by the classroom because uh, later in August is when um, class started up again, school. And then on the bottom right is the who, and those are problem behaviors by student. So this allows us to identify, our, do we have youth? And because uh, Swiss was developed for schools, that is the language that's used. So we always like transfer it and say youth. Um, but we can uh, zone in here on what are, who are the youth that are having the most challenges and what can we do to support them um, in, their, in their behavior. Okay, so both of us, all of us have talked about how important it is to share data with the staff. We know uh, that research says that the frequency with which data is shared with staff uh, affects sustainability, it affects buy-in, and it's so, so important. So from the very beginning, we talked as a team about how can we share all this cool data that we're collecting with the staff. Um, and the, the team identified a variety of standing meetings where that can be shared. Um, as well as uh, their quarterly all staff trainings. So since we have started, um, we've had multiple ways of sharing data with staff. Uh, listening to today's um, talks and uh, participating in the forum, I'm realizing that we, we need to make this more of a standardized thing. So team members who are listening know that we're gonna come back and talk about this because we really need to get that data out there on a regular basis and uh, potentially uh, look at how can we also share data with youth. Um, so in standard meetings that are scheduled, the data is shared. The creative thing that we did was we also developed a Google form um, where the staff created, um, or the staff were presented with the data reports, and then there were little quizzes that had program incentives. So we wanted to teach them how to attend to the data because we can't just assume that people know how to interpret graphs. So we asked questions like the time frame that was represented, the most frequent uh, problem behavior, uh, how many youth had the most referrals, and those types of things. And we really got some nice information from that. Okay, this uh, graph I'm gonna, or this table I'm gonna walk you through because this is like the bread and butter of what this has all resulted in. I have uh, several examples here of actions that we've taken and outcomes based on this database, database decision-making process. So one of the first things we realize is, if you look at that top row, is our data indicated that we had a really big discrepancy in terms of the number of referrals per each staff member. We realized there were contributing variables to this. Many of the staff are working overtime. They're on the units more, they might be fatigued, there's inconsistency, which we see in all settings about who people who write more referrals and people who write less. And so the team decided that they would offer increased staff training and support um, to try to, and this is an ongoing uh, process that we're still working through. So I don't have any data yet to uh, share out on, the, out, on uh, the outcomes of that. The second thing was we identified that there were problem behaviors specifically transitioning from dinner to unit. And we realized that youth are going from a preferred activity to non-preferred. Um, so we pre-corrected, they went back and trained the staff to pre-correct proper transition behaviors and up the magnitude and intensity of re uh, reinforcement and the frequency of reinforcement for youth when they displayed those expected uh, behaviors. And we saw a decrease. The next was, as I mentioned before, we had a high frequency of tracking forms for a small number of youth. We realized that some need more individualized support. And so we are looking at increased tiered support for those youth. 
Another uh, problem uh, behavior that we, uh, our data was showing to us was that, that there was increased uh, challenges during group sessions. We realized possible contributing variables were that programming was inconsistent. Um, you know, staff weren't necessarily running the groups the same way. The content wasn't the same. It was it might not have been as structured as was required. And also a very large group size of 13 to 16 youth, which is a lot um, considering uh, the challenges that uh, the youth present in the facility. So our action taken was to schedule out the programming, make it more consistent, reduce the group size, and also up up the, the reinforcement during those challenging activities for the youth. The next one was we have a large number of referrals for defiance, and this has been across the board since we started collecting data on the Swiss platform, which I believe we first started officially in May. Uh, we were ready to start entering data. Obviously, we realize this is due to a lack of those appropriate social skills to, to like deny or delay or refuse, right? So we have PBIS lessons that have been developed uh, focusing on teaching those pro-social replacement behaviors. And then finally, um, another example is the large number of referrals happening in the dining hall at dinner time, which I showed you on that time chart, 6 p.m. Uh, the staff recognized that uh, people weren't following the discipline procedures accurately in, in the dining hall. So all we did was, and this is, and these action takens come from the PBIS team members, by the way. This isn't me telling them what to do. This is them knowing their setting, knowing their data, knowing their staff, knowing their population, and coming up with these solutions. So uh, they increased their supervision in the dining hall and they implemented those discipline procedures consistently. And here's the result of that very simple intervention. On the left there, you can see in the month of July, there were approximately 28 problem behaviors documented in the dining hall. Um, in the month of August, one month later, that dropped down to about 12, just, just by putting increased, changing the supervision and making sure people followed the discipline flowchart. So that was a pretty remarkable outcome. Uh, this gets into the fact that we have uh, so many minor defiant behaviors and we can't really drill down and target because there's so many ways that defiance can occur. So we did end up adding in some custom fields. On the left there, you can see for minor problem behavior that was defiant, we added in things like banging and kicking on doors and walls, failure to maintain a clean room, and exchanging food because all of those challenging behaviors most likely serve a different function. So we need to look at our replacement strategies and our corrective strategies differently. So we can't just look at defiance as a whole. On the right for major problem behavior, we had to add things like disrupting count and gambling, um, refusal to uncover window, uh, tattooing, branding, or piercing. We had to add those types of things because all of those are going to serve a different purpose and have a different context. So we don't have any data yet on this because this is a very recent change, but this is something that um, came as a result of our, our data collection and recognizing our needs. I'm almost done. So for those of you who are worried, <laughs> I know I'm getting signals about time remaining. Um, I wanted to share with you uh, what the staff said when they took that Google quiz and they looked at the data. And the last question was, what did you learn by reviewing the data? And this is facility-wide staff. And it was so impressive to me to see them talk about how data can be aggregated and it can help them track, correct their problems. And it, and it really helped them identify like, wow, what's going on in the yard and what's going on Sunday through Tuesday? Um, that uh, they realized that it makes, the, it makes it easier for them to look for data and patterns. Um, they, uh, what I loved about this is that they talk about how convenient the data system was, how it helps them improve their overall performance. It gets them out of the stone age. Um, so these were comments uh, that the staff anonymously put forward um, in terms of this process. So that was exciting to see. And, and this final slide, I just wanna um, uh, give you just a general uh, view of the overall outcomes that have happened in such a short few months uh, going through this process. So overall increased buy-in from the facility staff as a whole as demonstrated by those comments and, and their um, actions in their work. 
Obviously, we've had increased database decision making. Um, we've been able to identify those patterns of problem behavior and have some pretty simple interventions to affect them. Most importantly, from my perspective, because I work on a grant funded project and it's my goal to get this facility up uh, to capacity so that they can say sustain it on their own, is that this Swiss system allows them instant access to their data and it's easy to use. So they're able to access it and analyze their data. And I tell them often, like, if I just suddenly disappeared, you guys could still do this work. And that's very exciting for me um, to know because, um, you know, it's, uh, the database decision making is just so critical when it comes to supporting youth and being able to, um, you know, increase our overall outcomes. So that is my um, overall uh, section on that case example. I know it was quick. If you have any questions uh, about any of the details of what I did, feel free to email me and, and Kim and Ashley's emails are up on that screen as well. Okay, excellent job. Um, and this question might go to Sherry or Kim or Ashley. Um, there was a question about how to add a behavior category in Swiss. And then I, I think that question was answered, but in case people missed that, can you talk just a little bit about the adaptability of Swiss for, for the unique setting of secure care and how you can adapt Swiss to meet individual facility needs. I'll just jump in with a couple quick things there. First, um, one thing that you could do is um, see if there's already a set behavior there that your definition could fit within. Um, and that, that the benefit of that in Swiss is that then that will show up as its own distinct behavior in your graphs. Um, another option is that you can set a custom field um, where you name it whatever you want under other, um, but that does re result in addition, an additional step to pull those custom fields out um, in a graph. So it's really, it just depends on if you can already fit it into something that might be a little bit easier, but if you're okay taking another step and if you really wanna have those custom fields, just you can set that up easily. Sherry, do you want to add in? Ex what, excuse me? Oh, you want to tag oh, yeah, on? Yeah, I was just going to jump in just to bring back because I know I've shared a lot of information. So the two custom fields that we had had to add in were the sexually related offenses and the use and possession of contraband. And then later on, we also added in a drop down custom fields for the types of minor defiance and the types of major defiance. Also know that when you're using Swiss, you would have a trained Swiss facilitator, which Kim and I are both trained Swiss facilitators that would help with that process. So you wouldn't have to figure it out all on your own. Okay, thank you. So I would like to remind everyone that uh, Kim and Sherry will be sharing more information about data in our webinar on, on December 3rd. Um, they'll be talking not only, they'll be talking about Swiss and certainly the usability of Swiss and the benefits, but also in general about data and how to manage, how to get the kind of data that we need um, if you're not using Swiss. So if you're interested in joining us for that, just email me and I will uh, share registration information. Uh, I would do that right now, but it's not, I don't yet have the registration information set up. So if you will email me, I will get that to you. Um, Sherry, Ashley, and Kim, you guys did a great job. And we can tell you have so much information, so much, so many good experiences to share. I appreciate your time and, um, all the effort that went into preparing for, for this presentation. So I think we are just a couple of minutes out. Um, I don't see any other questions popping up. So I would say happy Friday, everybody. Go out and uh, practice all the good, apply all the good tools that you've learned and make good use of the information that has been shared. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the great conference. <laughs>
Bye, Ashley. Thank you, Landon, for your help. Thanks, Landon. Bye, everyone. Bye.